Excellent. I'm going to begin next Sunday preaching on the Incarnation, but this Sunday I want to, right after we, I'm on the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus talks about worrying about what you eat and drink. We just, none of us probably worried about it, did we, last week? I think we all had plenty to eat and drink, didn't we? And uh, we were, our tables hopefully were abundant, overflowing with, uh, with plenty, because, you know, the, when I was a kid, my mother always put out the cornucopia, is that how you pronounce it? Cornucopia, which is like a wicker funnel, and out of it, it's got all these, uh, you know, plastic grapes and fruits and things that show the tremendous outpouring of God's blessing. We are blessed folks beyond our imagination. If you don't believe me, just walk into a grocery store and spend about 20 minutes just walking around and looking. Sometimes, you know, I got a list. I know where everything is. I ignore everything except I make a beeline for that. Then I make a beeline. I, want to, I try to time myself. 11 minutes, I'm out of here. I'm, not, I'm curious. I'm serious. I'm one of these bang, bang, bang. I, I never go with my wife because my feet would be so sore by the time I got out. I'd have to go out on my knees, so I just get, I, you know, I complain if I let her go in, then I complain, what took you so long? I could have done that in five minutes. You're not seeing the new items. Yeah, well, anyway, <laughs> but we, if you want to just go and, and, and worship God, don't take a grocery list with you. Just go in and just slowly walk through. I don't know how many items are in it average grocery store, I'm sure over way over 10,000 items in every grocery store. It keeps store. increasing every year. Yes, yes, it seems like they... Because they get all these foreign countries, food... People from all. various other cultures come in to us, but, you know, we're blessed beyond our wildest imagination. But folks, what does Jesus say? Lay up not for yourself. I'm going to preach on this. Treasures on earth. Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We need to be careful that we don't just, everything's just about things. <coughs> Warning about my little grandsons about, you know, wanting things, wanting things. Because that's where your heart is going to be. And we ought to think about heaven and eternity. Because this is temporary, folks. Now, I know you young people have a hard time believing that because your whole life is ahead of you. And I, I'm happy for you that your whole life is ahead of you. I actually remember some of the days, not many, but some of the days when I was young. But someday, all this is going to stop. Your life is going to end on this earth. And they're gonna, you're going to go naked out of this world. Um, but I, I don't necessarily mean no clothes on, but I mean you're not going to take anything you've acquired in this life with you in terms of physical things. The only thing you're going to take with you is your character. You got that? That's all you've got is your character. You take that with you into eternity. It doesn't, Brother Harry, if you ever beat one drum, because I'm just reading about this right now in his book, no one's character changes at death. Whatever character, this is in the book of Revelation, whatever character you leave this world with is the one you're going to keep for the rest of eternity. There's no chance to say, uh, I want to trade this in here. I, 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 uh -uh. In fact, it's pretty certain that, and you know, I told you this story before at the end of, of, of one of C.S. Lewis's books. He has a chapter called The Bus Stop. I think it's The Great Divorce. I think Sarah, somebody, it's true. The bus stop. And what happens, according to C.S. Lewis, is every day a bus goes into hell. And uh, it's got, you know, buses now, if you look at them, it has their route or their destination up there, State Street East or whatever. On the, on the marquee of this bus, it says heaven. And anybody that wants to get on this bus can get on. And the bus goes up into heaven and it stops at the corner of Glory Street and Hallelujah. And lets everybody out. And the bus driver says, if you want to go back, I'll be here uh, at 5 o'clock. And then he takes the 
marquee, the little lever up there, and he twists it so it says, hell. Now, I'm adding all this. C.S. Lewis doesn't say this. But here's what C.S. Lewis says. At 5 o'clock that day, every person that got off that bus gets back on it and goes back to hell because hell, heaven is worse hell than hell. And someone said, well, how could that possibly be? Well, have you, have you ever tried to get somebody to come to church that doesn't want to come to church? You know, you couldn't, you couldn't take a team of horses in a log chain and haul them into church because they don't want to be around church. Actually, church would be hell. Harry used to tell the story about two cruise ships that were on the same pier. One was a gambling cruise ship, and one was a all-day, all-night preaching, Bible study, revival cruise ship. Well, it just so happened that a couple of passengers, one bound for the revival cruise ship and one bound for the gambling cruise ship, got their tickets turned around in the men's room. Just laid them down and one picked up the wrong ticket. And they each got on the wrong boat. You get the picture? The gambler would be in hell on the revival ship. And the preacher would be in hell on the gambling ship. You got it? Because where? Because why? Because your affections, your, your thinking is completely opposite of what is going on. So, uh, that's really true. Now, why do you get off on that? Where your treasure is. Oh, where your treasure I'm going to preach on that, so I'll get to that. I'm getting old, folks. I'm starting to forget what I just started out. I do that all the time. So, yes, Gene. It explains a lot in the why people won't see any problems in society today. A lot of people. Yeah. Because that's just the way they are. Yep. Yep. They approve, actually, maybe tacitly or silently, they approve of what's going on because they're selfish and they don't want anybody interrupting their selfishness. And remember, serving God means you die to self. That's, that's the definition of serving God. You no longer live to yourself, but you now live to God and for God. Amen? Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's, that's the definition of Christianity. You're dead to yourself. You're alive to Christ. That's, read Romans 6. That's Paul's whole argument in Romans 6. Is that that's why Christians don't sin anymore. Because we're dead to sin. We're alive to Jesus Christ. We're alive to God. Amen? And of course, God and sin are on opposite ends of the playing field. We're polar opposites. So, all right. Turn your Bibles to Matthew. What? Okay, Matthew chapter 6. We'll start at verse 22. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. Lord, help us this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name. To get a real picture and grasp of our the emphasis that our Lord is making in this Sermon on the Mount it is practical, it's for living, and that we would each one apply it to our lives as we uh, walk this pilgrim way. We'll thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 22. Uh, the eye is the lamp of the body. Well, that's true physically, isn't it? I mean, we... Can you imagine not having eyesight? That's, I think that's my greatest fear getting older is that I'd lose my eyesight. Amen? I don't, I, I can't anybody, I don't know anybody that would want that. So, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, Jesus is speaking spiritually, of course, here, not just physically. Although, there, for an analogy to be true, there has to be some similarity between the physical and the spiritual. 
Verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Now, King James says mammon, and, 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 and in one of the stories Jesus talks about the unrighteousness of mammon. So, uh, the idea is most men live for things, don't they? They live for wealth, they live for possessions. So, Jesus is just kind of shortcutting that by saying you can't serve God and man or yourself. You can't serve yourself and God. Now, this passage is one of Jesus' most important teachings. I've heard hundreds of sermons on this subject, and I'm sure, certain you have too, down through the years. And we ought to hear hundreds of sermons because it's a very critical point, especially in our materialistic society. We live, as we've said, we live in a land of abundance, far more than anyone could ever imagine. You know, we were even talking at Thanksgiving about what some of the things are, what forefathers wouldn't believe some of the things we have today. And even the pilgrims, you know, they, they had this big Thanksgiving meal, but they wouldn't have, they, they'd be in bewilderment if they saw the tables that we set today. So easily. You know, we don't have to go out and shoot the turkey. <laughs> Amen? Yes, John. Uh, you think of uh, all the things that each individual, each adult has in possession when they yep. get older. And then there's 300 million people, 330 million in yep. our country. And think of all that kind of, um, construction, all the stuff that was developed and yep. Yep. manufactured. Oh my gosh, it's unbelievable, all the junk. <laughs> well, and of course, what's the most bur one of the most burgeoning businesses in the whole United States? Cell phones. Storage units. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. That's true. They're putting them up like hotcakes everywhere. And For what? Expensive. For people to store their stuff they can't get in their house <laughs> that they might need someday at some point. Amen? So yes, we have. We, there's no comparison to what man has garnered in the last 50, 60 years, maybe even 100. Well, at least since the Great Depression, certainly we've had a, we've just seen our our uh, abundance go beyond anything we can imagine. Since yeah, remember the pioneers had yes. horse day once a week. Once a week, they lived in sod houses. They, had, they they didn't have many clothes to wear. Right. So uh, th this passage is very very critical. It's for us, and we need to understand this. Now Jesus is clearly and powerfully describing in this passage, the impossibility of mixed moral motive of heart. In other words, you can't both be holy and righteous at the same time. What is a motive? What do we, how do we as in Christianity define motive? Well, the driving force behind your decision. Right, it's the why of everything we do. Now, we teach and believe, and, and Jesus just taught here, there's only two ultimate or supreme motives of life. Only two. You either love God supremely, or you love yourself supremely. There's no other in-between. Do you understand? Because Jesus said it, didn't he? You, you're either going to love one master and hate the other, or vice versa, but you can't love both of them at the same time. So young people, you have a choice to make. Either you're going to live your life to please God, make Him happy, and every decision you make, now, you know, when you get up in the morning and you decide, I'm going to, you don't say, oh God, let me think, would Cheerios make you happy or Wheaties? That's completely left up to you. Many subordinate choices, in other words, choices that we make down the line, God doesn't care if you wear a brown dress or a blue dress today. You, you understand? Those things are left up to you. But if someone asks you, why did you want Wheaties this morning? Well, I like them. Well, why do you like them? Well, because uh, my mom says it's healthy for me to eat them. Well, why does your mom say it's healthy for you to eat them? Well, because she loves me. Why does she love you? Well, because she loves God. Or, you know, my mom wants me to do it because I love God. Ultimately, everything, if you trace it back, 
is either I, I do it because I love myself, I want to make myself happy, or I love God, I want to make God happy. Amen? Yes? Jesus said uh, the unrighteous are more shrewd than the righteous. Yeah, well, he's talking about in dealing with mankind here on this earth yeah. and our dealings among men. He's not talking about our dealings with God. But as we, look, again, we live in a flawed world. We have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So, for instance, when you take a job, you better know exactly what you're getting yourself into. You, you understand this? When Dave builds a house, he gets a, a guy that wants to build him a house, and he signs the contract. Dave's a wise man. He sits down and he tries to put, I know you do this, you put very specific rules regarding changes that are going to happen down the road in the middle. You don't want the guy saying, you know what, uh, I don't want three bedrooms, I want four bedrooms. And by the way, I want it for the same price too. Even though it's going to be more windows, more doors, more heating. You know, isn't that correct? So he's wise. He tries in advance to make certain that the provisions are there so that he doesn't end up like the unwise servant would have ended up, and uh, I lost my shirt on this thing. So we're, we're living in a flawed word, world. We're dealing with sinful people. So we need to make sure that we do our homework before we get involved in these things. Go ahead, Dave. Your example about uh, eating Wheaties. Yeah. Where the issue becomes is, let's say there's another sibling or two, and they also like Wheaties, and there's only enough for, for one. one bowl. Okay, very good. Thank you, Dave. What Keep are you going. Gonna, what are you going to do? Yeah. So you love your, you love God, so you love your neighbor. He commanded us to love our neighbors ourselves. Amen. That exposes what your treasure is. Right. Right. Is your relationship and your love for others what drives you, or self gratification? Yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. You got to choose God or Wheaties. Yeah. <laughs> well, all the, I mean, when you really stop and think about it, that's what it comes down to. We la we laugh about it, but in David's description, that's that's what it is. That is so simple little thing. It really is understandable. Thank you, Dave. You got me. That's much better than what I said. Uh, so, there's no in-between when it comes to your supreme motive of life. There's only two choices. You love God. Now, Jesus, in this verse, is not talking about your character. Your character is another issue. He's talking about your motive, the reason, the why. So, turn to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. So, now we, all of us have various motives presented to our minds, don't we? Uh, it's not just, there, there isn't just two, there's only two supreme motives, but there's other motives that are presented to our minds, and we have to kind of trace back why we're doing this thing. So here's what John says, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So this goes back to this Jesus saying, you either love God or you love mammon, you love the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its desires or lusts but the one who does the will of God abides forever. And Jesus, remember, many times he would use this, this concept of you know, who's my mother and father and brother and sister? Well, he says, everyone that does the will of God is my mother and father and brother and sister. So, supremely loving God is the definition of a Christian. You got it? You may have, your character may not be developed yet, but if your motive of life, your supreme uh, reason for living is I'm going to please God and love God and do, by the way, how do we, how do we know we love God? We keep His commandments. We obey His commandments. So we have, we have a definition for what it means to love God. A lot of people say, oh yeah, I love God. Well, they mean they get a little emotional flutter when they hear how great thou art or the old rugged cross. That's what they mean. But it doesn't mean that they regiment their lives every day 
to please God. That's what we have to do, folks. We have to regiment our lives. What am I going to do today with my time, my effort, my energy that I might be pleasing unto the Lord, right? And, of course, Jesus said you've got to do His will. And, and we can go through all kinds of verses that talk about what the will of God is for our lives. So, everybody understand this issue of motive. Okay, let's go back to Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 25. If anybody got a question about it, raise it now. I think it's pretty simple and straightforward. <laughs> Matthew 6, verse 25. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life. Now this is going to be a longer discussion, folks. Do not be worried about your life as to what you eat will eat, or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? This is a rhetorical question. The answer is, of course it's more than food and clothing. Look at the birds, verse 26, of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? This is the idea of the intrinsic value of, of objects that we see. And we know that man is more valuable than an animal because it, we realize that intrinsically from endowments that God has given us. Amen. We don't have to read this in the Bible. We recognize this to be true. Verse 27. And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? Boy, what a question. Nobody. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They neither toil nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? The obvious question is, of course he will. O oh, you of little faith. Jesus has to kind of put that little, little faith uh, comment in there. Verse 31. Do not worry then saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. Reminds me of black. I should. We should call this White Sunday. Because we have Black Friday. Now we have Black Cyber Monday. And of course sandwiched right between that is White Sunday. Amen. Because we're pure before God. So this is White Sunday. The Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your Heavenly Father knows what you need, that you need all these things. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. By the way, what's the understood subject? Yeah. You seek first His kingdom. You seek first His righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Do you really believe that? I hope you do. I hope you believe that. That that's what's most important. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Boy, that's the truth, isn't it? <laughs> we don't have, uh, John and I are pretty sore. I'm not really looking forward to tomorrow, so I'm just going to enjoy today. Amen, John? Relax, rest, lay around, not do anything too, too energetic. I'm putting a wood floor down. So after spending two days on my knees and up and down and up and down and up and down and in and out and in and out and in and out, saw the garage, tearing up the carpet, ooh, he's even worse than me, believe it or not. Because he's been sitting in a truck for about When you're on your knees, months. he's doing that. Just Oh, I have been praying many times, Lord, help this, help me get this thing figured out. Well, there's painkiller, too. Yeah, the painkiller doesn't hurt. All right, now, Jesus speaks about faith in God. This, what this whole thing is about is do you believe God or are you trying to figure it out on your own? That's really what he's talking about. Faith in God versus worry about life. Now, I know worry... I got to admit, I'm not a worrier. I don't know. Maybe some people have a problem with that. I just maybe maybe it's a man thing, Gene. Is it is it a man thing? I don't know. 
I think women probably tend to worry more than men. You, Cynthia, do you think that's true? Women? Definitely. <laughs> huh? You think that's true? Women tend to worry more than men? She would say, I'm thoughtless. <laughs> more effort than thinking about. Okay, women put more effort in thinking about. I, I think that's true, think right? It depends on the topic. Yeah, yeah the topic too. Yeah, yeah. When it comes to changing the oil, women they really don't care. She'll they'll worry if the if the engine seizes up. They don't care about that. But when it comes to changing the tablecloth, then they worry about the tablecloth having a stain on it. And somebody might wonder, if you're a good housewife or not. <laughs> Right? I mean, but it's interesting. Uh, Jesus essentially equates worry with a lack of faith in, in, in regard to these things, talking about what you eat and what you shall be clothed with. He essentially says, if you are consumed with worry or concern about these things, you don't have faith in God that He's going to take care of you. Amen? So, of course, I ask this question, well, where do, where do we draw the line between responsible concern and worry? Go ahead, Faye. Well, so it's, it's, we shouldn't worry about what we eat or material things. Correct. But, but how can we not worry about our children who aren't walking with the Lord? Amen. Well, I'm going to need some help on this one, I think. Bill, what do you think? Well, I mean, if you're going to be concerned, worry to me is a little bit different. I think being concerned about something, God is concerned. But yeah, resp I like this word, responsible concern. Yeah. Uh, well, we, can, we can even use benevolent concern. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I think worry has negative connotations because worry is sometimes you don't have any control over what it is and all uh -huh. you do is fret. It's Yep. Okay, I like the word fretting. Go ahead, Gene's clearing his throat. So, are you done? Are you done? Yes. Okay, Gene, go ahead. I was just thinking, worry is something that oftentimes consumes a person. All right, I like that. That's See, there's the point, I think, where that's all your life is about, yeah. is that issue. Now, let me give you an example. The street, this church right across the street over here, used to be called Rockton Church of the Nazarene. My wife and I attended there for a couple of years. I think the Andersons stayed five, 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 years. five years there. We were there only two years. This was in the 80s because John Cope was born while I was attending church there in 1980. There was a lady in that church. I don't remember her name. She played the piano. She had a son that was on a motorcycle yep. and killed on a motorcycle. But she... Lit, her whole life was consumed yeah. over this boy. Yeah. She'd have a picture, she'd bring a picture to church with the, of, her, of this kid. She'd set it up on the piano yeah. at the church while she's playing the piano. It's true. It, it's, okay, thank you. It's true. Her whole life was it was consumed with this. I think he, I don't know if he was drunk or not, but he was going he was going hundreds, hundred miles an hour with his motorcycle hit something and killed it. So I do think the idea is if that's all you think about, then that goes past what we call benevolent concern. It takes the place of God. Yeah, it does. Well, it takes the place of everything. Go ahead, Josh. Does it matter? Because if you read a lot of the Psalms, David spends what seems like constantly asking God about in certain parts of mm -hmm. Psalms to destroy his enemies and yeah. you know all this stuff. Those are imprecatory prayers. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, does it matter what you're? He seemed worried to me. He was begging God to take well, care. Well, you got to remember, as king, David had bigger concerns than just his own life. At that, you understand, he was concerned for the nation of Israel. As I think many of those imprecatory prayers. Were against not his own, not just his personal enemies, but against the enemies of God, uh, the kingdom of God, because of his his relationship. Now, courtly Saul was pursuing him, but you know David never badmouthed Saul. He he actually respected Saul as God's anointed. He said, he, "Remember, he had a chance to kill him twice," and he said, "No, I won't do it. He's God's anointed." So David didn't have any personal axe to grind, but. As the anointed king, he realized that big things were 
So is that, do you guys agree with that? Yeah. Is that, is that a good assessment of that? Yeah. So Faith, I think to answer your question generally, we all have concern about our kids. I talk to my children about it. I'm pretty blunt with them. I, I say, I don't know what your relationship with God is, but if you're not right with God, you're going to hell. And you better make sure, you know, I, I can't force my children to do that. I can only tell them point blank to their face what I think. Amen? <laughs> After that, see, I, I, I guess I'm not as worried in this, in this. I mean, I don't want anybody. I don't want, I don't want anybody to go to hell, folks. I'm not... I'm, I love God. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell, therefore I don't want anybody to go to hell. But I realize that these people have a free will. And I taught them right. They know what's right. And if they go to hell, that's their responsibility, not mine. Go ahead, Bill. I think one of the other things is we develop attachments to things and people. We have to be very careful that we don't get so attached to anything that's temporal or in this life. I mean, it, we're to disregard to a certain extent this world and live for Christ. Right. And whether it's our house, whether it's our job, or even our children, we can have attachments that are out of balance, if you yes. will, where we place too great of an, an importance on even that. Yes. And what's, it's hard not to do that because they are our children we've raised and we do love them and we have this emotional attachment but we have to be able to you know even give that over to the Lord. Well, isn't that what Jesus said and I quoted that verse Jesus said they said oh your, your mother and your brothers and sister are outside they want to talk to your mom thinks you're not eating right you know you're fasting too much and you're not you're staying up all night long praying and what did Jesus say well who is my family essentially Everyone who does the will of God. Now that doesn't mean we're cold-hearted and don't love our... No. I love my kids. I may not think everything they do is just right, but I love my children. And I, you know, I do things for them that I probably sometimes maybe shouldn't do, but I do them anyway because I love my kids. You know, now, and it's not because I'm afraid they won't love me back. I told my son Jeremy, called the other day and talked and talked and talked. It was great to talk to him. He didn't call me much. And I said, well, son, I love you. I'm so proud that you, you're a responsible person. And you know what I love is my kids, my three sons, and I'm sure if Johanna were alive today, she would love me and Paul just like children should love their parents. Amen? And care for their parents. Maybe they don't always agree with their parents, but they, you know, I'm so thankful that they haven't just thrown me overboard like so many kids do, sadly. Uh, with their parents. It's like, I don't want anything to do with you. Go ahead, Gene. I know a couple <clears throat> that have kids that are, to say, estranged would be mild. And they, estranged, yeah, not strange. No. I just want to make sure you, you heard it right. I'm not sure either one of those would have Well, but they're estranged. <laughs> they're, they're cut off from their parents. Yeah, and but every time you see them, they are long-faced, they have no, they're robbed of all joy. Yes, yes. And they're so consumed with a concern for their children. A person has to make up their mind. I mean, I, at least I did. I have to make up my mind whether it's really worth throwing all concern into my children and my grandchildren are to remain in the joy of the Lord. I don't think you can be in both. I think you could have a, a concern, a healthy concern, but to say that you're going to be consumed, that's yes. a different word. <laughs> yeah. You're going well, to be consumed with. The Bible and, talks about Jesus being a man of sorrows. Yes. Oh, I and think, I think. I think you have sorrows, but you can't let yourself be weighted down to the yeah. point. That well, you I, I don't see that in faith. Faith, I mean, since you asked the question. You're you always you've got a joyful countenance. It's not like you're just care, like carrying a heavy burden and can't hardly exist or live because of it. And you know there's a big difference between. Well, Dave that. might say different. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, I I I know you pretty well, and uh, you know well, I, it's, I feel it's a, a tough little, issue. I feel a little consumed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By, you know, mm -hmm. the state of my sons. Yeah. 
there's a measure of how does it affect our walk yeah. and our effectiveness. Mm -hmm. When uh, something becomes so overwhelming in your life that it shuts you down from being able to love others, right. to be able to be a witness, yes. to, be, to be able to minister to Keep others, to be brother. able to yeah. Effectively love others. Yes, you allow something to keep you from doing that. Yeah. that's the measure for me. Yes, amen And I think it goes back to this whole go ahead John But Jesus said it pretty plainly if anybody loves his brother or mother right. more than me Well, I so. took the words kind of out of my mouth. In other words The issue still is do I love God more than I love my children? Yeah, and we have I've told my kids many times even Benny, when he, Benny asked me the other day, do you love me more than God? Well, five-year-old Benny, I said, no, I love God more than I love you, and I do love Benny. Yeah. He's, he's pretty special to me. The thing right. is, is... I said, oh, we know. We know, okay. yeah. <laughs> the thing is, is yes. if you look at what God originally intended, that hasn't changed. I mean, that hasn't left. What God meant to exist between a parent and a child, mm -hmm. between a husband and a wife, a son and a daughter, you know, that tie, that beautiful relationship is, is what we were purposed for That's right. in walking with the Lord. Amen. That doesn't leave. No. That's still there. But the world has now changed because sin has sin entered into the world. Right. Right. And now we have to bring that into subjection to something greater, yes. something eternal. Amen. And that's why Jesus says, it's the one that does the will of my Father. Right. right. Well, there was a day he shouldn't have had to say that. Right. <laughs> about a son and a mother. Yes. And so we're in this situation now. We're in this place where it's a fallen world. Yes. And God has called us to be lights. There is a greater calling now. We can, But that doesn't remove what God originally intended yes. for us to experience in that relationship. That's right. So that's still there and we have to deal with it. Yeah. Now I've heard some people say from time to time, well, if, you know, if, I, if I'm in heaven and I think my kids are in hell, I, I couldn't be happy. But you see, because face going, yeah. Uh, it's, you're not the only one that is. I mean, I'm not, I'm not I, somebody else, I heard that from somebody else, not from you. So I don't want to pick on you in that. But here's what I say. When we see Jesus with our new equipment, it is true, I think Johnny Peterson wrote a song, it will be worth it all, somebody, when we see Jesus. All the trials of life, all the disappointments, everything will fade. Nothing, nothing will be important when we see Him. Now, that really begins here, doesn't it? You know, the Bible talks about perception. Seeing Jesus is not just with our physical eyes, because I've never seen him with my physical eyes, but I've seen him with my... Benny even talks about that. Oh, we see things in our mind. The five-year-old says, oh, yeah, we see things in our... We don't see him with our eyes. We see them in our mind. So we see Jesus now. And, of course, the world... A love of a mother for her sons and your children is a very profound, deep thing. I can't really, under, I mean, I love my kids, but not, the love of a mother is, is a very unique and special thing. But it's, let me tell you something, folks, nothing in this world is worth losing your soul over. You got it? No child, no spouse. You know, Brother Harry used to say this all the time, many people will be in hell because they, they love their husband or wife more than they love God. The thing is, though, is it's not really a true love. Yeah. It becomes a self -thing. Yes, yeah. It is. It, it's... Unless you love God supremely, you truly can't love right. them. Right. You love okay. yourself. It's all about you, not about them, really. It, it, under that circumstance, that's right. Everybody got well, that, what Dave is saying? Well, it's it's kind of giving in to this, that natural... Yeah. Re desire of that relationship well right. we're in a fallen world now and yeah. that has to be looked at in it from a different perspective right. as what our calling is now and you also must think of well how does God feel about us right. his creation yeah 
Yeah. No, you know, listen, how folks, does he feel about the lost? Yeah. Let me tell you something, folks. God is a person just like you. And he loves to be loved purely for his own sake. Remember, the Bible uses this term, for thy name's sake or for his sake. We don't love God for what we can get out of him. We love him for who he is. We just, God, I just love you for you. I don't care if you, if you get a, you know, pearly man, you know, a, a mansion of gold or whatever. I just want to be with you. Amen? David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of the Lord. Just I can be around you, God. That's all. I don't care about any of the other stuff. So it is, that, that's what Jesus here is talking about is we have to have faith that God's going to take care of us because He's the essence of our lives. He's what we want. We don't really care if we're sitting on a street corner, although David said, I've never seen the righteous begging bread. I've never seen him sitting on a street corner. Because, as Jesus said, He takes care of us. He provides for us if we believe Him and have faith. Uh, I just want to bring up the fact I appreciate this church because there's hardly any other church like this. <laughs> Well, you know, there are, there are people all over the world that love God who are the church. Not, I mean, maybe we I'm have... I'm talking about... You yeah, know, in our, in our many, modern society. There many churches will have this open discussion. Right. Here. Well, hey, folks, this is what it ought to be about. I want you to think. I want you to express your concerns. Amen? I'm not the end all. But we, together... The you know, Bible says, by the way, the Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together as is customary, but as you see the day approaching, we ought to be even more associated so we can encourage one another to love and good works. Amen? Because I tell you what, folks, it doesn't take much for the society to go south. We're seeing it now. And, uh, you know, evil people look for somebody to blame for the problems, don't they? Remember Hitler? He blamed the Jews for all the problems of Germany. And I can see the evil government blaming Christians for all the problems in, in our society. I can see that happening very easily. So, You know, this is also one of the reasons I think God has sent His Spirit, His Holy Spirit to us, Amen. in dealing with the very thing I was describing. Yeah. You know, we're in a fallen world. Yeah. God never meant for us to live in a fallen that's world. That's right. But that's why the Spirit is here to do what? to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and to take the things that Jesus taught us and reveal them unto us. So, this is what we're, what Jesus is teaching here. We, the Holy Spirit is going to reveal unto us these things. Oh, boy. Well, let, me, let me try to wrap a couple of things up here. Uh, Paul expands, I'll close with this verse, or these two verses. Paul expands on the solution uh, for those who have a tendency to worry. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Start at verse 6. Folks, this you ought to have these verses committed to memory, to be honest with you. This ought to be something that you repeat to yourself in stressful, difficult times. Times when you're tempted to worry beyond what you know you would be reasonable. Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the God of peace, who surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute or reputation, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. I'll just tell you a quick story, just and I'll close. I got one more verse there. Verse 19 will be the last word. Then he came over the other day and he was back in the playroom playing. I think I told this already, didn't I? In church too. But anyway. He comes, he comes out of the I call, hey, Benny, what's going on back? He comes out and he's crying. Big tears, alligator tears going on. I said, what's the matter? 
Mommy said something last night to me, and I just can't stop thinking about it. And he was, you know, he was upset. Whatever, I, could, I couldn't figure out what I it was. I asked him about it later, now I don't remember. Yeah. It wasn't anything. No, it's not, no, it nothing big, but no, he just, the point is, he got focused on that thing, and it made him so sad. So, you know what I did? I just immediately, we started doing something else. In 10 minutes, he was happy, laughing, everything was fine. That's what Paul was saying here. That's what Paul was saying. When you get in this concern, you, you start thinking on good things, pure things, wholesome things, upright things. Think on these things. Verse 19. Here's the summary. And by the way, Paul got this from this passage in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus is talking about here. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Amen? That, that's, there it is, right there. There's the summary of everything Jesus is teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Now, do it. Amen? That's our problem in the church today. Oh, we got all kinds of nice things, but nobody does it. You got to do it. That's the only way it'll ever work in your life. Young people, it's the same for you. You say, I don't worry about anything. My dad works and pays for everything. Oh, well, just get ready, because the day's coming when it ain't going to be that way. You're going to have to be working and paying for everything. Amen? So prepare yourself now for what we're talking about, and you'll save yourself a lot of grief as you go down the road. Anybody have anything to say in closing? You know, a passage came to mind, I shared this with Christy, where Paul said... His desire was so great for the lost mm -hmm. that he said, let me be accursed yeah. that they might be saved. Yeah. Now tell me he's not worrying about the lost. Yeah. But it's in, there is a, uh, a right measure mm -hmm. for that. That his desire was so great that they would quit harming God. Yeah. Quit rejecting this God that he knows. And that's, what, that's the point. It's not for them. It's for God's sake that he's concerned. Because he knows what it's doing. The Jews were God's people. And look what they did to him. Yeah. And that's what true love will do. Is it will just totally forsake itself. Right. right. On behalf of another. Yep. Now, God's not going to do that. He's not right. going to curse Paul. So that it doesn't work that way. But it, it's, it's right. the essence of what was in his heart. Right. It shows his motive. Yeah. And by the way, Moses did the same thing with the people of Israel. He told God, look, take my name off. But God says to Moses, no, he who sins, I'll blot his name out. So God made sure Moses and everybody else understood that's not possible to do. Okay? That's, that's not possible to do. So.